Okay, David, this is where we're supposed to choose a side, green or black. John, my soul is as black as night. Your turn. I am black for life. So we're not fighting? I thought this is where HBO wanted us to like pick sides and fight and stuff. Don't worry, I'm sure we'll find plenty to disagree about on the pod, but we seem to agree on one thing. We both really like this show. The politics, the drama, the lore. It was made for the lore hounds. And since we just finished recapping season one, we couldn't be more ready to defend our Black Queen in the Dance of the Dragons. And with the season pass option in Supercast, listeners can get early ad-free access to each weekly scene-by-scene deep dive, plus our custom show guide with all the characters and connections. See you in the Lorehounds podcast feed each week for our Dragonfire hot, but probably positive, takes. The Lorehounds House of the Dragon coverage is also safe for Team Green consumption. Side effects may include a deeper understanding of dragon lore, a hardened conflict with itself, and an inescapable urge to read the book Fire and Blood by George R.R. Martin. Dragon seeds may experience burning. Welcome to the Star Wars Canon Timeline Podcast. And the Lorehound Star Wars Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Alicia. And today we ask whether Sol and Chimir teach or corrupt in the sixth episode of the Disney Plus Star Wars series, The Acolyte. Listeners, for this crossover podcast series, we'll be following the apparently controversial Star Wars Canon (laughs) Timeline Podcast spoiler rules. We'll talk some more about that in the feedback section as well as the community's wildest and most popular theories and questions. But first, we'll look at each of the two sides of this episode, throwing out the most likely theories about that new planet, everything on it, and what is going on with Saul and Vernestra. We'll wrap it all up with a look at what's ahead on the Lorehounds Network this week. Check the link tree in the show notes for links to all the podcasts we host, plus our Discord, where the Acolyte Theory Crafting is heating up. And for the record, this conversation was recorded on July 4th, 2024. And America! Have... <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> you might have heard uh, another laugh here. And yes, we have David back to share his hot takes. Hi, David. Thank Hi, you, you for doing? stopping by. John challenged me to come at him with all my strength. So I had to show up for. <laughs> you were for a chucking quick cereal at me. So I said, come fight me on the pod. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, John and I are uh, more defensive of this show than uh, David's more in cereal mode, I guess. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think I was I was defending Athena Agilea's spouse who mm-hmm. uh, uh, had declared fan bankruptcy. And I was like, get that guy some cereal and have him enjoy. <laughs> I'm assuming it's a guy. Uh, mm-hmm. Apologies if I, my assumptions are Pretty incorrect. sure she said husband. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, That's a so, gendered term there. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a very specific gender term. Um, so my point was get that person some cereal, sit down, pull up a chair, pull up a bowl, and enjoy the show because I think the show is worth worth worthy and worthwhile for super fans and casual fans alike. And I think that mm-hmm. was my point. And John took exception at uh, at the fact that I, I think I was characterizing it as a Saturday morning pajamas show, yeah, as I opposed think, to a serious yeah. lore show where we really get into the details of the Star Wars extended universe. I, I'm not saying that that kind of show can't be bad. Uh-huh. I'm just saying. I don't think your cereal will cure it if it is bad. I think cereal, to me, a Saturday morning cereal show is a very specific type of show that is is an adventure of the week. Not everything needs to make sense. Not everything needs to be so serious. It's okay to just, you know, have your sugary cereal. It's it's part of that experience, right? It's part mm-hmm. of that, you know, lighthearted thing where where you just can overlook some holes. I don't think that that's a show. I think if you're not liking the show, the cereal is not going to help. That was my point. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was think, taking I it. I think as... Dr. David's diagnosis and <laughs> treatment plan was faulty. <laughs> well, I was taking it as that there is, I think there's more depth to this show than, and I think not everyone is connecting with the various layers that are making it so compelling for me. And I guess, you know, that's okay. Teach their own. Um, it does seem like there are a lot of people who are because we've got a ton of feedback today. <laughs> no, that's good. 
Yeah. Well, so that means that, and as we know, engagement equals enragement, right? So if people are reacting, the, the, it, right. it doesn't and have they're to be not, enraged. they're not reacting in angry ways. They're reacting right. in like theory crafting ways, which is right. you know, fun. People are having so fun with So it means something's, yeah, it means yeah. that it's, it's, it's affecting people in, in some way. Mm-hmm. And, and people, like if we're just like, oh, it's fine, then we don't re- respond. But if there's something we have to say, we get activated by something. Yeah. I, I would say that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a valid point in terms of what is a Saturday morning serial show. And we started using that term. John, I think you, you sort of coined that whole thing, which is like, oh, let go, have fun and enjoy. And so I was thinking more about it in that level. I don't know the canon and the, and the books and all of that stuff like you guys do. Mm-hmm. And I think there is a, a degree of the fandom which is also in that position where it's like, oh, okay, this is, uh, there's some cool action here. There's some interesting characters. They're doing some fun stuff with Star Wars. They're showing us a time period. I really like the fact that we're not on a kind of hero's journey quest uh, mm. to, you know, to find the MacGuffin that's going to overthrow the Empire story, mm. but that we've got a mystery that's happening and we're doing this kind of fun storytelling way of uh, looking at multiple perspectives and doing some flashbacky stuff, all of which I don't think we've really seen in uh, our Star Wars. And so I'm appreciating it on that level and what planet that is and what kind of metal that is. And how, is this the first time we've ever seen a, a, a Force Saber whip thing? You know, uh, you know, Sith, the history of the Sith. It's all blowing past me, but there is a logic and a consistency to it. So it doesn't feel like they're just uh, making stuff up and throwing it on the screen. It feels right. grounded and it feels like it knows where I feel like as I'm watching it that the that Hedlund knows what the hell she's talking about. So I can just relax and eat some cereal and and enjoy it in not in a in a in a God, this is awful, but I can't stop watching. Like, yeah. no, this is actually really enjoyable. And for a non- core you know non uh, for a fan who's not steeped in the in the literature as we could say i'm not an academic of star wars i don't know that i'm missing stuff and that mm-hmm. means something good right. they're telling a story that is speaking to me and all of the lore details are blowing past me but i'm not i don't feel like i'm missing anything and i don't feel like i'm being you know uh railroaded into having to learn the lore. I can just go along for the ride on this. Right. And I think that's great. And I'm really glad. And I also love to see all of the uh, the Star Wars haters out there. Well, there's kind of what the origin of the shit. It's like, <laughs> yo. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> you, fine. I will lore drop on them. <laughs> yeah. But Le- Leslie Headland is, and, and right. then I love the fandom. I love that the fandom has the ability to stand on two feet and go, um, no, actually, you're wrong. Go kick yeah. rocks because the it's so steeped in the lore and it's so mm-hmm. well rooted and I think for all of those reasons I'm enjoying the show. Uh, it's it's not an Andor, of course not. It's it's in its lane. It's firmly in the right. lane. It's, it's not supposed to be an Andor, right? Exactly. Like that's the point. Exactly. And it's great and it's enjoyable. And for me, I could sit down Saturday morning and eat a bowl of cereal. Um, and not and not in the way of like, oh, I gotta just like suffer through right. this. But I'm like, no, this is fun. This is like fun Star Wars. I like this. Is it is it engaging with you on the level of you know the interpersonal conflicts and things like that? Is that drawing you in? Not so. No, it's not drawing me in. I think what's drawing me in is the mystery is drawing me in, and and how she's using the the mystery to un the way that she's using visual storytelling to. Uh, unpack the mystery or to, you know, to figure out that's what's really, and then, um, uh, soul's, uh, performance, uh, Lee Jun, uh, what's his, I don't have his name on the top of my head. What's the actor's name? Oh, uh, uh Lee, uh, she calls him JJ. Yeah. J Jung. J- uh, Lee Jung. Lee, Lee Jung J. Yeah. Yeah. His performance is, is great. And, uh, you know, I, I love seeing a bunch of new actors that we haven't seen before. So the, mm-hmm. the acting and the script writing now, I know John, you know, may disagree with me. I don't think that the script is all that. I, uh, I disagree with you too. Yeah, I, I fully enough. disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is, this is the second best writing in Star Wars. And it, it, wow. And as far as dialogue mm-hmm. goes. How? Next I to Nemex Andor. Manifesto and Andor. Right. I, yeah. think, <laughs> I think that's the only dialogue in Star Wars that surpasses us. Huh. The, the conversations happening between Chimere and 
OSHA. I keep having to remind myself which twin we're talking which about. Which one is which right. twin is um, which? <laughs> I mean, it's literally the same actor. It's not even twins. So Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then the the way that Soul is talking to May, I just think that these are the best conversations that we've had. I, I see it as Andor, if we're comparing to Tolkien, Andor is about like the men of Middle Earth. And then uh, the uh, the the acolyte is about the elves of Middle Earth, right? These mm. like otherworldly beings that are Jedi and Sith, that right. are some some ethereal right. level above the other beings in this universe. Mm-hmm. And it's okay for those to have two totally different dialogues. Right. Yeah, pretty much. I, I think every character in this is a Force user, right. aren't they? Right. Yeah. Um. So, David, we, oh, yeah, and by the way, full spoilers, obviously, for the episode we're talking about in every episode before <laughs> it. Uh, David, we didn't get your hot takes on the last episode, which is the one everyone was talking about with the uh, deaths and the lightsaber battles. and That shocked me in that it was, first we got Jackie, and then I, we were like, I was like, wow, that was wild. And then, was it Jackie first and then um, then yes. uh, Yord? Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay, so so the red shirts... The, uh, you yeah, know, they, they went quickly. Yeah, they went That's quick, right. no problem. But then the way that she amped it up with those two, mm-hmm. that shocked me because clearly the fans were resonating with both of these characters, and she took not only one but two out, and that's mm-hmm. something. And I think then when Vanestra has to show up later, and and uh, Soul has to deal with the loss of his whole team, that is some bold storytelling for Star Wars. We uh, we don't get a lot of on screen deaths of major and minor characters. You know, red shirts are plenty, fine. But in terms of people that we're really resonating with and we want to hold on to, mm-hmm. that was shocking. And I think that was, it was really bold. And um, I, I appreciated it. And I also appreciate, <laughs> I'm just laughing, getting the visual, I'm laughing because both of their death scenes, okay, yeah, you know, death, whatever. But they were so shocking and she knew exactly what she was doing. Mm. And not only did she give Jackie this like kind of cool death in right. terms of the three puncture wounds of the mm-hmm. thing, but then the way that Yord went down was just a really, you know, <laughs> oh, he got, yeah, that it was just yeah. wild. And and for her to do that, I think is bold. And I, mm-hmm. I applaud her her doing that. And and it it ramps up some emotional stakes. Because you know, mm-hmm. uh, beloved characters are are down and out, gone. Right? That's yeah. that's something. And we so saw what are you going to do to us now? This week, they are mm-hmm. dead, dead. Yeah, yeah. There's no. Oh, maybe. Nope. They are dead. Yeah. And and that we see uh, uh, the whips or the scar and the whip mm-hmm. uh, in one episode. Uh, I don't think that that's a, a mistake at all. I think that's a very intentional. Uh, We're going to talk uh, about that for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And. Um, Boy, this is a thirsty, thirsty season of television. (laughs) (laughs) I I was like, (laughs) I mean, people said that it was like going to be the gayest show, but then Mm -hmm. it's actually it's it's really the straight gays or gay male gays, but it's you know it's centering, uh, it's sexifying especially a male figure, which is somewhat unusual. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about maybe getting a red lightsaber after the <laughs> yeah. end of this yeah. episode. I saw your comment, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's a good way to say it." <laughs> I feel like Michael Scott's gonna run in and go, "I'm coming out hetero." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, I I'm really pleased with with what's happening. I'm, I I love that the fan reaction. I love the story. I'm we we still have to learn more about. Um, Oh, what's the Wookiee's name again? I'm, I apologize. It's early. Kelnaka. 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 You, you know, you can hear him in that song that I wrote. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Uh, so we still have Next to. Week? I, I know we've got some Kelnaka stuff coming up. Yeah. I hope we get back to the the coven and the witches at some uh-huh. point. Um, we've got Saul being very sinister and ominous by taking uh, Osha. Is it Osha on the ship? Or is it uh, May? May is with Saul right now, and Osha yeah, so is with so her. May May on the you know strap you know strapped in on the bed and and all this kind of stuff. So I I think she's building tension really nicely, and I think the last episode we had a lot of good moving around. Like we we moved mm-hmm. the plot forward, we opened up with some new stuff, gave us some new mystery, and uh, answered some questions, and opened up a whole bunch more. So. From a pacing standpoint and the the 
the plot delivery points, like I feel like we're moving along at first, the first episode, I was like, Oh, I don't know. And this is, is cooking. I think she's cooking and I'm, I'm really, I'm glad to see it. And I'm glad that I'm glad that the star Wars fandom has something that to, to rally mm. uh, around on, on a cause. Like this is a good show. It's lore consistent mm-hmm. and we're having fun. So all y'all can, you know, yeah. Uh, no, there's a lot of fun things. conversation going on online with totally. you know, the memes and the and yeah. the theory crafting and yeah. Yeah, hot lore summer, right? It's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. full on hot lore summer. John, what did you think of this episode? I, you know, at times I was like, all right, get to the point. I do think that there were certain points like we need three times for Soul to be interrupted when he's about to tell right. May. Like that, that was, was the a one little annoying silly thing. to me. Yeah. <laughs> but really <laughs> that was that was a minor quibble because most of mm-hmm. it was really great. One one thing that I thought was really interesting is that people before have said that the um you know the dark side definitely lends itself to like desire, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we're told that like attachments <laughs> It, it lends itself the to the seduction of the dark, dark side. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and oh, yet, that's really good. I like that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what Leslie Headland cited that word is especially ex- exactly. Yeah. But yeah. no one ever talks about it because it's usually right. geared towards family friendly movies. Mm-hmm. And here we have something where you can explore that a little bit. Andor went into that a little bit, but again, Andor is about the mortals of this world, not about the otherworldly mm, force right. users. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is the first time that we actually get a Sith going. He lists desire as, as and an he looks her in the eye and pops like a grape in his mouth or something. Like, come on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I did my second watch with um with the audio description on, and like it is narrated like a romance novel during those scenes. <laughs> <laughs> like his his taut muscle, the scar <laughs> traces a line across his. <laughs> I saw, uh, I think, a tweet. Uh, oh, who's that big YouTube channel that does a lot of the breakdowns? Um, Which one, New Rock Stars? Or? Yeah, New Rock Stars. It was Eric Voss on, on New Rock Stars. And I saw a tweet just scroll by saying, no, you have to watch it with the audio description. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, watch, do this. And so I was like, huh. And I, obviously I did. But now that you say that, that's great. I love it. I love it. That's pretty funny. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, I, I am impressed with like... Uh, I've done audio description like when I've watched stuff with Bob and I am really impressed with how well they translate the visual into audio, you know, Mm -hmm. the words that they choose and the pacing and the intonation. And yeah, that's a lot of work. It's a whole Mm -hmm. separate mini production uh, to Mm -hmm. be able to to cue that stuff in correctly to write it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah you and have the to be timing, a really good writer. You have to do it, a, you have to do right? it around the dialogue and other mm-hmm. sounds you need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, right. that's really good work. Yeah. So yeah, I I love this episode. Um, this was maybe my third favorite of the season so far. It was a necessary, you know, last last episode went at eleven, so this is a necessary like you know down cycling, regrouping, realigning. Now that we've done the sister swap, yeah, I had a really good time with it, and there's a lot of very interesting lore teases, and um, also just. The relationships between the characters are, in my case, that that's really sucking me in. That's maybe mm-hmm. even more than the mystery elements. Uh, what's getting me into this show are the characters and the, their relationships with each other and the mysteries around that and all that. And where, how might they develop? Cool. So I saw, I read a really great interview this, uh, this week with Inverse. I shared that on the Discord. Uh, it was with Leslie Headland. And so I, I just wanted to share a few fun tidbits that I learned from that. And the first one is on the, you know, on the subject of the sexy Sith, M- Manny Jacinto first said no to the bare arms. Like he's normally, Leslie Headland's like, I was surprised because he normally is like very easygoing about that stuff. But at first he pushed back. He didn't want to do it. Um, but then, yeah, now here we are. So, oh, showing off his bare arms, you mean? Mm-hmm. The, oh, okay. The sleeveless uh, ropes, right. yeah. No, no. I think it. I think if he had been robed, I, I think. I think that whole question of of being enticed, being seduced, right. being uh, drawn by the dark side and what it has to offer, I think that would have been diminished. And I think by by incorporating the physical sexiness, right? I think it elevates that whole conversation. Right. I mean, and I she knew exactly what the effect was going to be. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, she's uh, she's. I don't know if she's attracted to men. I'm not going to speculate on that. She's married to a woman. She's married to Rebecca Henderson, who plays Vernestra. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but she she knew she was like, yeah, this is going to this is going to like make people go crazy because she was saying she basically is looking at all of us in the eye and saying, y'all are villain fuckers and you know it. And I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> what a statement. Yeah. Alicia, <laughs> it's nine in the morning where I, am. I I don't know if I can deal with that yet. <laughs> she she's calling us out like that. Hey, I watch these episodes at nine in the morning because uh, they <laughs> yes. release in the middle of the night for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, she also said in the interview that the stranger was originally going to be more in the background the first season and to tee up season two. But after she saw Manny Jacinto's screen test, she's like, oh, no, no, people are going to be upset if I don't give more of him in the first season. So Mm -hmm. she rewrote, she said she rewrote one later episode, especially. Maybe it was this one. Um, I just want to point out they keep saying Sith. So I still think she also says there's a reason why we hear Kylo Ren's theme, but she does also keep saying the word Sith. And um, she said about Jackie's death that she said the reveal was not that it was Chimere. The reveal was just that like it, it the reveals that a dead body falls and you see this guy. The reveal is your favorites are going down. Welcome to your new favorite. Mm, nice. Nice. I like that. He's sweeping the table and and yeah, we 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 want favorites and we want to root for him. People mm-hmm. really love Jackie, right? That was a huge Right. And then uh, we fan. love the one who killed her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even more. And so the setting yeah. up that that conf- that conflict of like, oh, you just made me hate the, you know, made me fall in love with the the person I want to hate. Yeah. Like uh with Gawain and uh Crispy Cole. It's like, okay, you made me like Crispin Cole for one <laughs> one odd <Right>. second. <laughs> right. <laughs> or Otto. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's a uh, scenes where you're I like, don't know. Oh, I still don't like Otto. <laughs> this is House of the Dragon talk, by the way. <laughs> We're mixed. It's hot lore summer. We're mixing. Yeah, it's hot lore summer. <laughs> our shows. Yeah, and so I'll put a, a link to this article in the show notes for anyone who wants to read it for themselves. There's also a bit about the cortosis, which again, uh, she, you know, she emphasizes just she works with Pab- uh, Pablo Hidalgo. Who anyone who doesn't know, he's he's one of the most important people in modern Star Wars because he's kind of like the. He's like the lore master, basically. The lore mm. keeper, I should say. And so she worked with him to make sure it was all accurate. So that's why you, we see it so brittle, brittle that Jackie could elbow it and break it that way. Because it has these incredible properties, but it shouldn't be this like super metal that's, you know, undoes everything else. And also the fact that it's really rare. Right. And and did we see a vein of it we on did. the planet? Okay. We did. So that, we, now we know where he got it and probably why he's and hanging out there. Exactly. Why he's there. That that made a lot of sense. And then yeah. obviously I think the next big uh, round of conversation is is this um what's the planet that Luke was on in the in the sequels? Uh Achto, but um Achto. Sh- let's see how that we're going to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to talk about it, but Leslie Headland came out and said it's not Octo the planet. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. glad it's not. I I, mm-hmm. I think that that's too member berry e. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you're trying to tie together. A, a, it would make a lot of sense if it were. I actually, well, I was slightly disappointed when I found out it wasn't. But I think so. I thought that they were going to combine Octo with his planet from uh, Legends, and now I think that it's just the planet from Legends, which is like an ocean planet where they mine cortosis um, and it's, yeah, it was a, it was an important place in the story of Sith Lords, Darth Tenebris and Plagueis. So mm-hmm. it's called Baldemic. Hmm. Every time you say Octu, I, I want to think Haktua, but that's a whole yeah. other <laughs> Oh, stop it. I just <laughs> learned what that is. I didn't even know. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Did you see the original video? Oh, it's funny. Well, no, somebody showed me because okay. it, I was like, I don't know. You got to give them some of that Hak. Tua. Tua. Yeah. <laughs> that Octua. All right. Back to back to this. Back to Star Wars. <laughs> Speaking of thirsty, I think yeah. that every time we have a story set on one of the same five planets, mm. the universe feels smaller. And mm. this show I was say, <laughs> is one of the first A Jedi die. A Jedi yeah. does not get its lightsaber. <laughs> Look, I, I I think that this show is a really nice breath of fresh air because mm-hmm. it makes the universe feel bigger, not smaller. Right. I think especially if we have Chimere become not a Sith Lord, but instead a Sith fan, I think that mm-hmm. would be a really cool way to expand the universe. Like 
of course somebody would learn about the Sith, especially mm. if they were part of the Jedi. Like that's in the archives, right? Like that knowledge mm -hmm. is in the archives. I of course they would learn about it. Somebody's bound to like that idea. Right. And and that's just more interesting to me. It feels much more real realistic. Right. I mean, I think that it's a combination of things. I think we'll get into when we get into the breakdown, but I think that maybe he was a Sith apprentice and is no mm -hmm. longer or I don't mm. there's a few ways that this could go. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The well, and I think it goes into Venestra and why did, you know, clearly there's a relationship there. Was mm -hmm. she his, was he her Padawan? But why do you say clearly because of the scar? Yeah. And just in terms of uh, mystery show plot setup stuff, uh, mm -hmm. there she's, she's not a minor character in the sense of she's some sort of faceless bureaucrat that sort of, right. you know, uh, whatever. She's now showing up in the plot straight forward. Mm -hmm. Like I got to go figure, I have to, I have to go. Mm -hmm. Not another rescue team, but I have to go. Right. She's well, clearly, she's, she feels bad. She sent Saul and the crew there to get killed. Yeah. Right. And now she's wrecking. And I think she's starting to see the pattern mm -hmm. of Chimere's movements and saying, I recognize, I feel the, some familiarities here. And so, yeah, the, I think the whip and scar are our first, um, straight up clues, uh, mm -hmm. to, to point us in that direction. But then just looking at the characters on the board, how can we put pieces together to make a, a interesting mystery. And so it just feels like, oh yeah, these two are, are potentially, um, uh, there. She's got to be powerful Jedi, right? Uh, and uh -huh. I believe right. she's got a lot of, she's, she's an history. extremely powerful. She's one of the most powerful Jedi that has ever lived. And Chimere has power because when he flicked mm -hmm. his fingers and knocked them all on their asses, that mm -hmm. was some power. Right. Yeah. And, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, there's just a lot of, of clues there that make me feel like there's a connection and, and did she screw up in some way and, uh, or, you know, what happened? So that's, I'm engaged because yeah. I want to know why right. did these two come, come apart? What, what's dark in Venestra yeah. that, uh, allowed Chimere to, you know, um, taste the, you know, taste that and to, to want to have more of it or what did she do or stop him from doing or whatever. There's, there's yeah. something there. And I think, I think there's a darkness in Venestra that has to be part of the cause of, of Chimere's, um, path. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, I, I definitely agree with everyone that of course the scar on Chimere's back looks like it could be a whip scar, although it forks. So it would be yes. two whips. Mm -hmm. Or alternate theory, could it be a lightning scar? Mm. Oh, he went mm. crazy from the lightning. I mean, look, <laughs> like force lightning, like a, a Sith, force. a Sith attacked him because maybe. Oh, he's, right. mm. So he says he used to be a Jedi. So okay, we'll take that at face value. A long, long time ago, whatever that means, because he looks like thirty. But um, well, he could be using the, his force powers to keep himself de-aged. Is that a thing? I mean. He would Haven't be, we seen the opposite with the dark side, though? Like, usually it, the dark side really... corrupts the way you look, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So but maybe no. he's... Ooh, but maybe he's different in some ways. Yeah, or maybe, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I have, like, mind transfer theories brewing in my head or mm -hmm. something that he's cloaking his appearance or, yeah. The dark side of the Force is a path to many physiques some <laughs> consider to be unnatural. Unnatural. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know. He was definitely, uh, let's say he was definitely a Jedi. If he says so, I have no reason not to believe him on that. Um, but maybe he was already also a Sith and left or was rejected or thrown away, as he said in his own words. And now he's looking to start a new type of order, cue Kylo Ren theme song. Which I think plays into some of the themes that we're dealing with in terms of uh, the witches, and the Jedi coming in, and May, and Osha, and um, oh yeah, we're going to make you a Jedi, and you're going to come in, and it's like, oh no, you washed out, bye, mm, mm -hmm. right? And it's like now he's like, okay, but why? And then she's dealing with the whole things like, well, why aren't you a Jedi? Why didn't you mm -hmm. complete your training? Well, I failed. Right. Did you fail, or did the Jedi fail you? You know, that's mm -hmm. I think there's something really mm. interesting there as well. Yeah. All right. Well, should we get into discussing? I know, David, I think you... I'm going to head out. To, yep. Yeah. Okay. 
I got to go uh, blow some digits off my hands and uh, <laughs> celebrate uh, our, our independence from the British. Ah! You make sure you keep that emergency room on speed dial. <laughs> uh, but thanks for, for letting me uh, stop on. Uh, John uh, John threw down the gauntlet, so I had to, I had to come at him. So. Well, thank you for stopping by and sharing your thoughts. It's good. I'm glad the show is uh, firing on, on multiple cylinders, and I'm, I'm glad mm-hmm. for our community. I'm glad for the fandom. And so, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Talk to you guys later. All right. See ya. Okay. So John and I go forward with episode six, teach slash corrupt. So we've got that slashy episode thing again. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I kind of like it. Like it's, it is a unique thing for this show. Yeah. No, I like it. But then, you know, of course, then I ask like, what does it mean that some have the slash titles and some have the solo titles that obviously link up? So we're still waiting. I still think next week we're going to get, free will or choice, as Mm -hmm. you said. Yeah. But Star Wars Explained, I think it was, pointed out that the titles are one word when the sisters are together in the same place. So maybe that's it. That seems plausible. I like that. So the writers credited for this episode are Leslie Headland and Jocelyn Bio. And um, Bio, Leslie Headland, of course, is the showrunner. And Bio uh, is a playwright turned TV writer and producer who worked on Russian Doll, which Headland did. uh, And she's got to have it and much of other stuff. And the director this time is Hanel Culpepper, who's best known for her episodes of 90210, Parenthood, Criminal Minds, Revenge, Grimm, and lots of Star Trek stuff like Discovery and Picard. Nice. Yeah. So for this one, the action is basically split between two different locations with two sets of characters. So let's just focus on one set at a time and then do a little Vernestra interlude. Okay. Sounds good. So we've got part one is May and Soul, and then Basil and Pip were also there. And this is, do you think this is the teach side of things? Or do you think they're trying to suggest this could also be the corrupt side of things? I don't think she's teaching it. I don't think he's teaching anything right now. So I, I think perhaps corrupt, but it's not soul corrupting. I think it's Osha trying to corrupt the ship. Or May trying to corrupt her. Yeah. Fake Osha. Fosha. Right. Uh, she's, she's like, I don't know how to do this. Let me reset. Well, she basically killed... Uh, Osha's droid. Yeah, did she? Did May kill Pip? Because if so, I think May killed Pip. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah, she just killed her droid. Do. Oh, what if I factory reset you? And it was so yeah. casual too. Uh huh. Yeah, I think she didn't realize until later when Saul's like, you know, Osha always loved that droid, and she's a droid, and she's like, oh, and he's not even on the right <laughs> body, and yeah, yeah. I wonder if that'll be like the last straw. Because think about it this way. Osha, yeah, yeah, we've heard multiple times, including from Soul this episode, that Osha's really attached to that droid. Mm-hmm, mm, mm-hmm. If that's Osha's last attachment, right? That she's going to uh, to lose now. Is that grief going to fuel her fall to the dark side? Yeah, I do want to just point out there is something that happens later in the timeline where um, a favorite protocol droid, who we all know and love, um, he gets reset because they want him to be able to access. Yeah. The Sith language, which is forbidden otherwise. And um, his eyes turn is red. Is that like, why? Yeah. Oh. His eyes turn red like we see Pips turn red in this. And um, I mean, sorry, minor spoiler, but like that turns out okay. So there's hope. Okay. So I wonder I wonder if it's like I'll put you into factory mode, but there is still like your memory bank somewhere. You just yeah. can't access it right now. Maybe, maybe the there's a backup in his body or something. I hope. I don't know. She looks pretty emotional when she lost the head, so I don't know. Yeah. 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 I don't we'll know. see. But this is definitely the thing that May has done that I'm most mad about. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty cruel. And um, for what? Yeah, exactly. So for this one, I just took like brief synopses from StarWars.com, the official synopses. And then uh, we'll get more deeper into like the lore and, and key lines and things like that. So StarWars.com says about this part, nothing is as it seems. Jedi Master Soul plots a course for Coruscant after making a harrowing escape from the tragedy on Kofar. But there's an impersonator aboard the Polin, May, disguised as Osha. Just as they're about to jump to light speed, the ship's power fails, sending quote unquote Osha off to put her non-existent mech neck skills to good use. <laughs> After evading Pip and Basil, who sniff out the ruse, May plans to beat Sol to his confession, trying to long range comms to inform Coruscant about the truth of what happened on Brendock. But the Jedi Master stuns her, promising to finally tell her his Brendock story next week. <laughs> 
So, John, I have to ask, how are your suspicions after this episode? Again, I don't think he directly did anything wrong, but I think he participated in the cover up. He was yeah. an accessory after the fact. He says, time for me to face the high council to tell them everything. So there, right. he he feels like he has something to tell. But this is also and like I feel dumb saying this after we were like, oh, they're pointing too hard at Chimere. He can't be the Sith Lord, which I still think he's not the Lord Lord. But um, yeah, it feels like with Soul, like he's feeling guilty and they're trying to make us wonder if he's guilty. But maybe um, this is a, a misdirect. And he, it's like right. he's a little bit guilty, but not like. You know. Right, right. I think well, I think part of it is he he felt he probably felt like it wasn't his story to tell, right? Mm -hmm. Because this was really the story of the uh, the other Jedi who did the wrongs, right? I don't know, right? I don't know, and right. we know that this Jedi Council is about to face an audit, and they hate transparency. <laughs> so yeah. I think that um, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna play that game. I think perhaps they knew about some kind of threat like Chimere, maybe not Chimere himself, but like Chimere that was on Brendock and they hit it because they knew that nobody wanted to hear about it. Nobody right. wanted to actually address it. Well, I think the senators, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the senators uh, that they're talking about with this Jedi audit, I feel like this is setting up leading into the separatists that appear in the next era. Okay. All right. I'm into that. I like yeah. it. So we get, um, so by the way, Saul, he calls out emergency code zero, and this is a critical distress signal for uh, the Jedi. So this is like emergency code zero is just like, this is the ultimate max emergency call SOS. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, Makes sense though. Yeah. Uh, so do I, do you think like the whole thing where Saul, he turns off his tracker and leaves I think he heard, like, they were having disrupted communications back and forth. Um, but I feel like he heard her say, stay there, and then turned off his track tracker and left immediately. Did you get that sense, too? And why, do you think? I think he, want, I, I, maybe he didn't know it was May at first. Mm -hmm. And then he later decided, well, now that I know it's May, I'm going to have, I'm going to have an audience with her before they get here. Because we see that right after he goes away. The Jedi mm -hmm. get there. You know, the hyperspace is fine. You know what I thought was interesting was Vernestra is so nervous about flying into hyperspace. Is that because she was so involved with the Nihil stuff? No, it's on? because it's because um, she when she was younger, at least when she was in hyperspace, she would sometimes get these visions and she didn't enjoy oh. the experience of it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that was a fun little Easter egg for book readers. Um, OK. Um. Yeah, I wonder if I think I still think that Saul knew it was May the whole time, but he only he only knocked her out when she was like going to make the call. And he was like, no, no, no. OK, but I think he like obviously he called her out with Pip the droid. But I think even when he sent her to fix the ship, he knew like this is not the mech neck sister. Right, right. That's my interpretation. Right. Yeah. Maybe that was a test. Right? Yeah, that's is, kind of what is, it felt like. Like he could. Fix the ship himself, but he's like, mm -hmm. okay, let me see if that's actually her first. Right. Do you think, does Saul even know that Basil's on the ship? Because it seems like Basil's always flitting around in the background and not like <laughs> interacting with him. Yeah, could be. Could be. I don't know. Do you think that Basil caused the power outage uh, to lure May so he could uh, try to attack her, which Ooh, was adorable and ineffective? I could see it. <laughs> Basil is is smarter than we want to think, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I love that like he and Pip were kind of squabbling like kids the first time they met, and now they seem to have done a team up. Right. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so meanwhile, while this is going on, we've also got Vernestra, who's uh she goes back to Kofar with a mission team and makes a startling discovery, <laughs> which is basically a bunch of dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about whether the light whip might be connected to the scars. Um, we we definitely see when she pulls it out, like she attacks an umber moth that was like just entering the clearing behind her. So the force is still strong with this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she just senses. She didn't even look at it, basically. What did you think of the light whip? 
I thought it was very cool. I want to see more of it. I, okay. I didn't see enough. I didn't get enough. Yeah. Yeah. It was very cool to see it on, on uh, in live action. It is from, obviously, she does she designs this when she's younger in the books. Um, we've talked a lot about it in previous episodes. So I won't go too much into it, but like she can switch it. So it's either a steady state, like a regular lightsaber or this flexible whip type thing. And yeah, the light whips, this is not invented for the High Republic. It comes from Legends. Although there are in the High Republic novels, there's mentions of Night Sisters having light whips. So I want to see that now. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, it is interesting. It's purple. So that makes one of two people we know with a purple lightsaber, her and Mace Windu. Oh, that's a good point. And, you know, of course we have that debate of like, is the legend saying that it's mm-hmm. it's like partially light and dark? Is that still something that's canon? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um. We see her doing something else that's very familiar from from the Jedi games. She's uh, she's got psychometry skills, it seems, where she oh, walks yeah. around and can like sense the force echoes of events that happened in the places. Right. Did that give you flashbacks? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's <laughs> that's straight up a whole mechanic in the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, there's a fun, well, fun Easter egg. I don't know, if fun's the word. There's an Easter egg that I only found out in the Star Wars data bank, but her ship that she travels there on, it's called Kantaros, which Imri Kantaros is the name of her Padawan in the High Republic books. So those mm. are those particular books are set 100 years before this. So um, regardless of what happens with Kantaros in those books, that character would, pro- he was human. So that character would probably be dead by now. Uh, but just very interesting, uh, a little Easter egg there for that or something more. I don't know. We'll hear theories from people and the feedback. What did you think of? Um, I don't know if it's her new Padawan or he just works for her, but Mog Adana, what did you think of the new not Yord? The new, the new not Yord, you said? Yeah, oh, he, oh, he oh, made the, me uh, miss the, Yord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the guy serving. Oh, I'm really suspicious. Like really, uh, really, really suspicious. I think. The, the way that he's like, oh, you're coming with us? So I don't know if you should come with us. Uh, I, I was a little suspicious of that. I'm more suspicious of him than I am of Ernestra, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, uh, he rubs me the wrong way. But like in the way that you did, but it makes me be like, oh, you're the wish Yord. You're, you know, the Yord we have at home. You're not the good Yord. It makes me right. want Yord back. I bet it's like that same sort of, well, actually, personality. <laughs> <laughs> well, poor, uh, poor Yord. He's gone. Yeah. He's confirmed dead. He's confirmed. He was looking rather pale. Yeah. Yep. A fun e- Easter egg about Magadana is that his his first name is named after the script supervisor, and his last name is named after the director of episodes three and seven. Hmm. For Adana. Yeah. That's fun. You know who else has a fun name? So we saw her on her little Skype call with, um, yeah, a species called an Abednedo, which we'll talk about in a second. But this senator is called I said what you want, or as it's more <laughs> properly pronounced. No, it is actually named after that lyric he's actually named after that lyric every abonetto is named after a beastie boys lyric (laughs) (laughs) so we've got um the first one was in the force awakens hello asti named after hello nasty (laughs) um (laughs) we've got some other ones that are and this is all like the pablo hidalgo he's the one who's like okay you um so the first one was because J.J. Abrams, uh, who was directing The Force Awakens, loves the Beastie Boys. And so Pablo Hidalgo like, was like, let's take this joke and run with it. And so he named all the rest of them after that. <laughs> so anyway, that's a fun one. Yeah. Uh, the Abanedos, so they like they look like mammalian like catfish people because they've got these like flat faces and mouth tendrils. And they were originally underdwellers who evolved to live on the surface. And um, they are actually like really uh intelligent um they are curious linguists they live in chaotic cities so they actually seem like cool people to hang out with they're just like these this species that shows up in the background a lot of the time yeah 
There was one in, in uh, Young Jedi Adventures, a pirate with a redemption arc. And anyone who's seen the show who asks which pirate with a redemption arc is forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the name, do you know the name Abinetto, like from biblical references? I don't remember it at all. Uh, so Abinego is apparently like at one point in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar II, he, the king of Babylon, he threw three men into a fiery furnace, three Jewish men, who for refusing to bow to the king's image. And they were saved, and the king saw four men dance, dancing in the flames, with the fourth being the son of God. So that's where the name of the race comes from, because that name is name-dropped in a Beastie Boys song. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also just, there's another, like, actual fishy uh, species seen in the background a lot in this show called Selkath. There's one particular character who keeps showing up. So just uh, that is a completely different species. The abonedo are mammalian. The selkoth are fish. Mm. So that's our entry into the Star Wars databank for today. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do wonder this whole like Senator Ray in court, could that be a seed for next season? Are we because she made a point of saying the name several times and that he's never been a friend to the Jedi. So I'm wondering if that's setting up a season two story. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think you know, as we get closer to the end of season one, I'm like, what questions are we leaving open? Because I think it might be a lot. Hmm. I feel like we're nearly to the end of the questions. But well, I guess, yeah, I guess it depends. Yeah, because every question you answer, you you open up more. Like the more we right. learn about Chimere, the more I want to know about Chimere. Right, exactly. And I don't think we're going to get all the answers on him this season. I don't think that was because he wasn't even supposed to be this big a part of the season. Right. So, by the way, the part of space that they're talking about with where the senators are like banding together to say we need to look into the Jedi, that's called the expansion region. And that's between the inner rim and mid rim. And so this is a different region of space than we talked about at the beginning of the series. And there was Corpsec where the Nemoidians were suddenly wanting to have shields repaired where they never had shields before. Mm -hmm. These are two vastly different regions of space, not really near each other so very interesting uh makes me wonder if there's something wider going on that the jedi right. are overlooking right mm. i'm suspicious yeah i'm very suspicious <laughs> do you have the sense that vernestra has an idea who's behind this whole thing yes <laughs> <laughs> i think she suspects chimera i do think that it's very possible that that was an apprentice of hers mm -hmm. she says something know. Something to tip the scales. And that seems to be in reference to something only she knows and the audience does not. Right. Right. She didn't exactly defend Saul when Moggy asked about it, did she? No, she didn't. And I wonder if she's going to just, I mean, she was very quick to blame Osha, right? Like she'd been looking yeah. for a fall guy for this the entire time. Yeah, I'm worried for Saul. I think she knows it's not Saul, but I think she might set him up to take a fall. Right. She just, I, I think. I think less so than um, le less so than the fact that she's a Sith Lord. I think that it's possible that she just wants everything to go away. You know? Mm, mm -hmm. I agree. I think that that's what it is, too. And I know book readers are like, oh, but she was a hero. But yeah, I think you can also see you can see the the roots um, in her younger story of of how she would end up becoming you know, so many people become what they want to avoid you know they become their parents she becomes her parents in a way but it right. takes her she's been alive for what like 150 years now or something or <laughs> more right. than 100 yeah right okay well shall we take a quick break and then come back and get into the ocean chimera side of things yeah definitely all right Okay, so the other side of the episode, Osha and Chimere, or Disney seems to really, or uh, sorry, Lucasfilm seems to really want us to call Chimere the stranger, but nobody Ooh. calls him that. Yeah. It's just not the rings of power. Can we no. just be honest with ourselves? Let's, let's, enough of, enough of these mysterious titles. Just name people names. 
Yeah, well, names. he says he doesn't have a name yet. But he uses Chimera Boo. like as an alias, but I think it's because <laughs> he's, his name's going to turn out to be Plagueis or something. I don't know. His name's going to turn out to be like Bob. Like he's just he's <laughs> like this is the lamest name. He's like my name is uh, what, what was the one from Ahsoka Malik or Marik <laughs> Marok <laughs> Marok. Yeah, no, his name's going to be like Paul Bob. David, yeah. John, you know, <laughs> something basic. He says he doesn't have, he's, if he's so old, maybe he's lost his own name to himself in some way or he distanced himself from it or. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? But okay. So the Star Wars.com um, official summary of this part is Meanwhile, the real Osha awakens mm. on an unknown world where someone has been tending to her wounds. Unmasked, the stranger begins to educate the former Jedi Padawan on his philosophy on grief and the power of the dark side, attempting to seduce her to his cause. So, oh yeah, credit to Abby who called out the, she's the one who first found the name of those little creatures we find on this unknown planet. They're called the Skura. The Skura? Skura, something like that, yeah. And they're not the <laughs> same S-K-U-R-A. as the, uh, they're not the same as the ones on Luke's planet. The, the no, the milk. Porgs. Yeah. They're not well. So, on on Octo, there was the which is a um, a location for anyone who doesn't know that shows up in the sequel trilogy. Um, we talked about it in uh, in the Dawn of the Jedi and other overview episodes in the Canon Timeline podcast. But yeah, so there's the Porgs there, which fine they they could not show up. But this is, we know this is not the planet. I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, there is on that Octo planet these Thala siren, which we see a character milking at one point for like a turquoise milk. Um, and those look kind of like bigger versions of these screw up, but I think they are just completely different animals, maybe biologically related. Yeah. Who knows what's related in Star Wars? Everything's made up in the points yeah. don't matter. The script description says they're part anteater, part duck. The screw up. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. They look like little. They camouflage as rocks. Like at one point, um, Osha walks by and they just freeze until she walks by, and they pretend to be rocks. You know. Yeah. And they're like nuzzling each other like little turtle doves. They're cute. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so they definitely labeled every other planet that we've been to in this show, all the ones they made up, and you know, regular ones like ones we've seen before, like Coruscant. Um, except this one, they make a point of calling it the unknown planets and Leslie Headland, she admits it, it looks like Arto. She said, it's not Arto. I know it's similar and it was intentionally supposed to be similar in terms of terrain and feeling isolated and surrounded by water and less lush green and more rocky. But the idea is that the cortosis is mined on this planet. So I don't think that's the case with Arto. Part of the reason that this is his home base is that Cortosis is a very rare metal. I don't think we say it explicitly in the show, but that's the reason it's not Arto. So yeah. So it's not Arto because Arto is not a Cortosis planet, which of which there are very few. Mm. And it is filmed in a different place. Arto is pl- filmed off the coast of Ireland, and this is filmed on Madeira. Which okay. I want, which mm. I really want to go to now because like basic, yeah, most of the is show beautiful. is filmed on my, Madeira. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So there was, I don't know if you remember, John, the, there was a Clone Wars um, little sequence, story sequence about a Cortosis mine that uh, gets destroyed. That was on a planet called a Mokivj, if that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> but most people think that this planet could be a planet that's only been in legend so far called Baldemic, like I mentioned. Mm-hmm. And Baldemic is described as an ocean planet with rocky tropical islands and um, in the outer rim. And it's uh, mostly the people who visited there were there like for science and um, also for the cortosis deposits. And yeah, it happens to be where the story between the Sith Lords, uh, Tenebris and Plagueis came to a head Hmm. in Legends. So could play the same role here. Yeah. If it's the same. Yeah. Huh. I'm into it. I'm into it. I'm like, <laughs> you're selling me on the, on the lore here. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's fun. I love, I love, because like David said, it doesn't take anything away. If you don't, if you're not like, I don't know, it's just a planet, right. whatever. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Think of it and like that, and yeah. 
I'm glad that you brought up Cortosis because I, I did not remember it from the Bane books. Mm. And, you know, it, and it's even name drops in this episode, right? Like they finally mm-hmm. said it. Right. And I, I the minute I heard that, I I felt you in my mind, in my force <laughs> bond with you. I felt you point at the screen like Leo in that meme. <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> it's real. Yep. Did you also notice that both sisters, so of course, Osha now has one of May's knives or probably more because May seems to just have endless knives. Uh, but mm-hmm. they both approach each other's masters with a knife. Do you think that me that it's like showing they're more alike than Osha thinks? Yes. I think that she would like to. I think, well, I think both of them deny their parts of the other one that are in them, right? Like one of them wants to be fully dark. One of them wants to be fully light. And neither well, I don't, of them are I don't either. know that Maya wants to be fully dark. She wanted to be with Osha, fully with Osha. And that was with Osha was like, that's too much. Okay. Fair enough. That's my interpretation, at least. Fair enough. Um, I need. I don't know about you, but I need to know why Osha left the order. And I hope that that's... I'm sure they're eventually going to tell us, but I hope that that's one of the mysteries we get resolved in the next two episodes. Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I couldn't see them, you know, moving that to next season. I think that's too much. Right. They teased it too much, right? Right. Yeah. Chimera's, of course, he loves to play on like this is this is how emotional abusers treat people in real life. They're like, oh yeah, no, they all rejected you. Nobody else will love you like I love you, baby. You know, why do you still think of yourself as a Jedi? You have more in common with me. I'm the same as you. Mm. I like it. How, what did you think of his responses to her getting mad about him killing her friends? I mean, he's so much. You know, as much as the Jedi say we don't feel the emotions, he's way more cool and collected mm-hmm. than they ever are. Like, even Soul has a, a fucking meltdown on the ship. Yeah. yeah, true. Like, he is on the struggle bus. Yeah. He is really just having a hard time. And, yeah, I think I think Osha sees that. And, and oh, sorry, May sees that. No, it's uh, Osha. It's so he's different talking from to her now. master. Yeah. No, I meant, I meant, uh, Soul oh, is the, on the struggle bus. Right, 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 right. And Macy's, May, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Macy's more remorse in him, perhaps. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think Osha, she accepts it pretty quickly, what Chimera says to her. She's like, you killed Yord. He's like, a man who doesn't hesitate to turn you in for a crime you didn't commit. And it was like, she was like, okay, fair. You know, she didn't say that, but it felt like that was her response. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, more mad about Jackie, which to be fair, I'm also right. more mad about Jackie, right. but... And then right. where did you think that was going to go? It would have been a one-sided relationship like your master. Why do you love people who can't go as far or deep as you can? Yeah, that's a good question. Why do you love people who are less than you? He asks. Right. Right. Because oh. mm. she says so. Yeah. <laughs> but he manages to provoke her anger. We see her flex the force. Like, you know, he tells her, um, apparently we, we learn that like, I'll get into this in a sec, but apparently the force is fading with her. Cause she's been, it's been atrophying cause she hasn't been using it. But now he says the shortcut is to just like feel dark emotions and use that side. And she can now ignite the saber. It's the first force yeah. thing we see her do. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I like the whole seduction angle. You get more flies with honey. Yeah, yeah. There's an interesting juxtaposition where we hear from him. He says, I lost everything. When you lose everything, you are finally free. And then May says to Saul, when you really want something, it can cloud your mind. You see what you want to see. And it's that feels like what she said about that as much as much about the Jedi as a Sith, but it, like she's coming out of that clouded mind and realizing that Chimera was manipulating her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I th- it's it's interesting to see one fall into the seduction of the dark side and the other one get out of it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Passing each other like ships in the night or like right. ships coming and going from Kofar. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm still very curious how this forced dyad stuff is going to work out if this has anything to do with that. Well, he says so he says that um, she asks him, what do you want? Well, he's yeah. OK, so he says, let me see. Where did it? Where is it? Um, I made a mistake with May. I thought she wanted more than just revenge. I thought she wanted what I want. And Osha says, well, what do you want? He says, the power of two. The power of many. Yeah. Power of many. (laughs) (laughs) 
So the power of two, of course, it crawls back to the witches, but the power of two is also, of course, the rule of two, the Sith thing. Right, right. And also why, you know, I think he does want to create a force dyad. So I don't know if he wants to create one between himself and one of the twins. Or if he was trying to manipulate mm-hmm. one that might already exist between the two of them. Right. Right. Hmm. Because I feel like he knew Osha was alive before May did. Yeah, I think so, too. I think he uh, he hid that from her deliberately. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of the um, helmet meditation sequence? The sensory deprivation tank of the helmet. Oh, um, I, I absolutely she was going to pick it from the beginning. Like she was mm-hmm. just curious, like, what can I do? And she has. She has been very, very, very. Um, what do I want to say? She's been very, very less, less, uh, less than her sister. Her whole life, right? Like her sister Mm -hmm. has always been the powerful one. And now she is finally getting getting an opportunity to be something more. And that's interesting. That's that's something that is a temptation that I think she's going to fall for. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting because like they're using the same tools like meditation, you know, to clear your mind, which you could it's it's as light side as it is dark side. But um. We find that in Star Wars storytelling and probably in life, when you're left alone with your own thoughts, like we see when the, uh, we, there's a trope in Star Wars where Jedi go into a cave and they're confronted with the dark side. Um, but also it's, it's as Chimera says in this episode, when you're in that state, it's just you and the force and what you bring with you. So you're bringing that dark side in, confronting that side of yourself. Yeah. I I found it, I I thought the filmmaking was very, both like calming and unnerving, you know? Yeah, it was, it was. And yeah, I don't want to put that mask on. I would be very frightened. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you you can't see it all. He was really, he was doing all that stuff without fully being able to see. Yeah, that's insane. That's insane to me. Uh, But uh, I saw a tweet and you're going to have to bleep me, but uh Kymir walked so could run. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, that's just a blind Jedi from later in the timeline. Um so how long when Kymir said he was a Jedi betrayed by his master a long, long time ago. I can still remember. Anyway, um, how long ago <laughs> do you think he's he means? Like that makes it, he, it seemed like he was emphasizing it. Like not, it felt like more than like when I was a kid, it felt like centuries ago, but I've been frozen or in stasis in a back to tank. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a weird one. And I don't know. It could, it could be just that he sees his childhood as long ago, or mm-hmm. we could have some crazy, you know, body transfer stuff going on. Like you mentioned earlier. And I, yeah. I, I don't think we've ever seen a successful body transfer, right? Um, In the visual well, media. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, if the one at the end is deemed successful yeah, or not, yeah. but it's definitely something they're going for. So it could be, I mean, because there's a lot of things that the Jedi and Sith were capable of that become lost arts later in the timeline. Right. Right. Hmm. Mildly interesting, right? <laughs> mm, mildly interesting. <laughs> Wait, what was it? Somebody said. Uh, uh, oh, somebody had a good word for it in the Discord, and I can't remember who it was. Or what they uh, well, said it was. I, I it was Rafo, and we've we've no, no, no. But it was Rafo. something else. No, somebody else said something else. Anyway, oh, that's some hot lore. Yeah, no, it was another one. Anyway, the wheel weaves. No, 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 no. It wasn't right. wheel. Well, specific. one day we'll. Figure it, it had out. lore in it. It had lore in it. Um. We also find out that Chimere says he's not reading people's thoughts. He's reading their emotions. And I bring that up because I already mentioned Venestra's former Padawan, Imri Kantaros. And it just seems interesting to note that he uh, he had like an extreme version of empathy was his sort of force talent. Mm. Uh, So it it caused debilitating mental pain when he was dealing with other people's emotional states. Uh, So. It just, uh, Imri was a blonde, you know, and this is a recently released book and, you know, really recently released material and they're not, 
he definitely does not look like Chimera, just putting that out there. But it is yeah. interesting that uh, they both talk about this emotional connection and right. maybe have a connection with Fenestra. Right. Hmm. What did you think about? There's lots of questions we've gotten about this comment that Osha said about the force fades if not exercised. That's a great question. And I was thinking about that. I was like, have we heard that before? Because I don't not think really. we have. I mean, maybe maybe we've heard that you get out of practice, but that's mm -hmm. way different than saying like your ability in the force fades. Yeah. Yeah. And especially she's only been out of the Jedi Order six years, right? That's not that long. Right. Well, it is. I guess it is when you're 20. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. That's true. <laughs> a long time ago. Right. But I wonder, yeah, I do think that they are setting up overall, like we know that the Jedi become, the force becomes more clouded for them a century after this. Uh, and the Jedi become more conservative and institutionalized. So it feels like they're kind of setting that up and how maybe their lack of, you know, doing these great feats with the force they used to do caused them to atrophy. Yeah. And that's why we don't see it later? Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. So there are two explanations for this clouding of the force that happens in the next era of the timeline. Uh, one comes from, and both of them tie back to this point in the timeline. So one comes from Legends, one comes from Canon. The one from Legends says that in 150 BBY, uh, the Sith Lord Tenebris and later working especially with with his um sorry with his apprentice Plagueis tore a hole in reality basically Ooh. letting more dark side leak in and then the sith for the next century just kept continually expanding that tear until it clouded the light side of the force by the time of the prequel trilogies the canon explanation comes from the high republic book light of the jedi uh which is the first book a lot of people read in the High Republic reading. It's uh, the first mm -hmm. adult novel in phase one, which is actually the second era chronologically. But anyway, we went through all that <laughs> in the High yeah, Republic. I, I actually, I just read this book. So it's fresh in my mind at, at the very okay. end of that book. So you remember, do you want to read the quote? Oh, sure. sure. So it was from Marcian my Rowe, who was uh, the head of this, like of these Nihil super pirates that we've mentioned. And right. he's, taken Loden Great Storm, who is a Jedi who showed up in Young Jedi Adventures. Um, he's taken him captive and says it. Is he young in Young Jedi Adventures? No, no. He's, oh, there, he's, with, he's, he's with, there with Bell, his Padawan, who's okay. hanging out with the kids. Yeah. Gotcha. My family knew all about you people. They told me what you could do and how to resist it. He gestured vaguely toward the other cells filled with tortured prisoners. They're not getting out either. If they die, I'll just bring in more. Their job is to fill this entire deck with pain and anger and fear. Makes it hard for you to think, doesn't it? Hard for you to call on the Force. He leaned back against a nearby wall and crossed his arms. My grandmother told me how to do it. She learned from hers. You don't imprison Jedi behind bars. You do it with pain. Yeah. So, so who's, who's Marta on that, on that chain? You know, the grandmother, right? The the single grandmother. I it, it was probably the grandmother's grandmother, right? No, I think. Oh, uh, hundred years. Said she yeah, there's a hundred years, right? Well, no, yeah, but and then she passed it on, yeah. Yeah. So I'm. I so I. But it says my grandmother told me how to do it, and she learned from hers. Right. So the first one in that chain of knowledge has to be Marta, based on. Hmm. You know, okay, but there's a hundred years the in between, so is there? But anyway, they're passing it down through the row family, and for yeah. these are not force sensitive people themselves, so it's not the same as Chimera, but right, it is like this philosophy of you, yeah, you basically distract the Jedi with uh, echoes of pain in the Force, right? It's so. interesting stuff. Yeah, there was also. Um, in the High Republic, there was a Transdotian Jedi, which is like Transdotians are like lizard people who are especially known for, uh, they're, they're often slavers and they often had Wookiee slaves. So Wookiees like to rip their arms off, but that's uh, uh, neither here nor there for this. But, <laughs> but there's a trans Transdotian Jedi named Seeker uh, who lost the force due to something called Magrock Syndrome which is a syndrome that causes transdotions to experience rage and aggression. And the minds attempt to stave off the encephal... Oh, I can say that word. Encephal... 
genetic disease, <laughs> encephala. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, medical people, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it makes it impossible for him to connect with the force. And this uh, this helps him in the plot of his book, by the way, uh, because they're fighting this force eating entity called the Nameless that John and I've talked about before. Uh, right. But yeah, just another way that it shows that like that seems to be the w- direction they're going in canon, that you create more confusion and pain and aggression to cloud the light side with just negative right. emotions. Yeah. Which I, I think that's more interesting than having like magical talismans basically Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's fair that's fair otherwise it's just it's just i i just don't think that's as interesting as like as doing it through the inherent weaknesses and being a good person right right yeah i mean and also just the fact that like the sith have been whatever this this plan is um They've been concocting it now for 900 years. That was how long the rule of two has been in place since the collapse of the old Sith Empire and everything. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it better. It's something you have to give them credit. It's something they've been building. And so thus it should not have a simplistic answer. It's something that has to grow over these centuries until they've reached the point to pounce. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So I found it really interesting just because we've been talking so much about like how much the lore of this show is or is not new. I actually found a Reddit post from nine years ago, so not really (laughs) that recent. (laughs) And um, they say that basically this this falling of of, you know, the clouding of the force, they say it's not. Oh, and this is, by the way, from Fantasy Liver. Um, Fantasy Liver says this is not due to Darth Sidious's influence on the dark side. Darth Sidious being a Sith in the next age, important Sith in the next age. Um, it's due to the Jedi themselves. So keep in mind that the Sith have only had two members of their order for at least a millennium. How then does such a small order with nowhere near the resources of the Jedi manage to become so powerful, especially when in the old Republic era, there were thousands of Sith present and no Jedi mentions of uh, their force ability weakening. So this is due to the fact that the Sith order is very adaptive and fluid to a modern world. While it is shown that the Jedi are held back by ancient traditions and a rigidity that has turned many Mm. of its members against the organization. The Jedi have not advanced their philosophy since the old Republic era and the stagnation manifests itself in their diminished force ability in the clone wars alone. Oh, well, and then we're going to skip that because that, um, so I just think it's, it's interesting that like people are saying like, oh, this, this show is making people question the Jedi. Like, no, this is from nine years ago. And this was already the storytelling people were picking up from Star right. Wars. Oh yeah. You know, it's funny. I was saying that I think that this is the most lore heavy Star Wars has been in a while. That's live action. I think the animated mm-hmm. stuff right, has actually right. been the source of most of the lore drops in the last right. few years and the books too. But, but mm-hmm. as far as on screen. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. And and a lot of these people saying that this is all new just didn't watch that stuff, which, you know, not everyone can watch everything or read everything or, you know, it's just a massive amount of content. Right. But just uh, if you think something might be new, maybe look it up because maybe it's not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And of course, we see also people sever the force. Uh, we see this a lot later in the timeline. People do it intentionally because they've been traumatized or they want to like hide themselves in some way. Um, mm-hmm. We see very rarely, but especially in Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, someone's cut off from the force by the Jedi Council. Is that permanent? Uh, well, spoilers for Kodor, but it's, we're after that in the timeline. So yeah. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Pretty much I, you know, I, yeah. I own KOTOR and I've been thinking uh-huh. about playing it, but I'm like, one time, two, it is so dated. It's so hard. Yeah. So I, I did listen to a lot of your episodes with Bob with that. Yeah. Because uh-huh. I was like, maybe I'll just Well, that get... was, yeah, the KOTOR episode was with, was with Marchin. What Was with what? Was with Marchin. He's a game player. Well, oh, Bob plays games, Bob. but oh. Bob doesn't, uh, the Star Wars has not yet made their games accessible for the visually impaired. Well, tell them, get on it. Yes. Tell I them do, if I yeah. can do my alt text in Notion, <laughs> they can make their. <laughs> we have to shout out Cambrian, Cambrian Mammal on Twitter who tweets at Star Wars once a day, every day, urging them to at least put alt, alt text on their uh, Twitter posts. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Good to give them that nudge. 
Yes. Maybe someday they'll pay attention. They actually did it for like, okay, when there was, uh, what was it? The Star Wars um, big convention in London. They mm-hmm. did it for like a week and then stopped again. <sighs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> That's bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully Star Wars Alice. I will say as much as Ubisoft has its issues, it is very good lately at accessibility. And mm-hmm. now that they're making the new Star Wars game that's coming out in August, I think that that will be something good. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I, I'm, yeah, that's going to be a fun one, even though it's not like I do tend to like the force users. And this one is the, you know, the uh, scoundrels. But it's it looks great. The world building. and Yeah, like, I don't know. I really liked the battlefront campaigns. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I think that I'm going to like this. I think I'm going to okay. like it a lot. OK. Um. So just, yeah, I wanted to mention two other like force nullifiers is uh, one from Canon and from the High Republic books. We've already talked about the Nameless, which are also force eaters. And also the E Salamiri are from Legends from the Thrawn books, although we saw a statue of them in uh, Rebels, the animated series. Oh, really? And, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I only learned about this creature recently because I read Heir to the Empire. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they create like, they're almost like like a steading in Wheel of Time turn, terms, like where they create yeah. like a dome of where you just can't touch the force. Yeah, but it's not like suffering like the nameless do. It's it's just no. you're like, no, oh, so that's these weird. Are different. I feel like I've lost something. Like I've yeah. lost like a sense. Mm-hmm. I'm blindfolded. Right. Not that it like destroys you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But just, yeah, so uh, it seems maybe just putting out there, these are the options that could be at play with what's been going on with OSHA. But I think we're meant to understand it's it's mostly her own psychological trauma. And then she right. breaks through because she goes the easy way through the dark side. Is that what you took away from it? Yeah, I think she, uh, she's she got some performance anxiety. And Kymir mm-hmm. sees that and he's going to play on that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, should we get into the feedback and see what other people say? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Do you want to uh, take the lead on the feedback? Sure. So people can hear another voice. <laughs> sure. I know. I know. I'm. I feel like I, because I, this is my second podcast of the day. Yeah, I'm I know. A little, yeah. Like, I don't know how much I have left of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> we just for anyone who's wondering, we just had a a deep dive into the fifth element for Lorehound subscriber. So I appreciate that you've carried a lot of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, I'm like, here's more lore. Eat it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, it's uh, it's the Miss Trunchbull cake, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wanted more lore? <laughs> <laughs> All right. John M., after episode four wrote in, the Kalnaka death lends even more credence to Vernestra being the Darth Tooth. Snakes are green, just saying. <laughs> So we know after episode five, of course, we know that it's that Vernestra is not Darth Tooth, but a lot of people are still really suspicious of her. And I thought it was really funny since <laughs> snakes are green, just saying. <laughs> yeah. E-Hoop after episode five said, I think it's most likely Vernestra. She's <laughs> some sort of witch. She's got the whip and I think the light whips are witch stuff. But what if it's also- Osha? Here's how I could see it working. Osha either carried darkness in the beginning and saw the Jedi opportunistically less likely or slid down a dark path in the wake of the trauma of losing her family and blaming her sister. Possibly she already knew May was alive. Maybe she finds a Sith holocron that teaches her some stuff. She leaves the Jedi Order with the intention of getting revenge or possibly innocently and then finds a holocron and or learns that May is alive while also getting all Sithy with it. <laughs> uh, she plots revenge and disguising herself recruits Chimere, who under her direction recruits May. She orchestrates the whole mm-hmm. thing, intending to culminate with either becoming a dark side duo with May or taking revenge on May, who she believes is responsible for the deaths of her family, more likely. Maybe she's using Pip as a two way hollow Im- hollow con thing thingy thingy hmm. all right uh probably pip is some mode is in some mode that doesn't remember uh pip most likely turns red a la c3po speaking the sith language i mean that did this was written that by the way happen, before yeah. this episode yeah <laughs> yeah she stayed home on the night of the first murder to communicate with chimere in disguise she hollow projects instructions to chimere things go awry when may learns osha is alive and begins to repent Osha has no plan for when the roles are reversed. At some point, 
Chimere becomes alarmed that his real master, Osha, hasn't made contact and tries to ping her. May is carrying Pip now, and we have a cut from Chimere trying to signal to Pip having a red light flash. Osha being afraid to stun May, but trying to recruit Yorb, Yord, uh, is trying it, uh, blah, 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 to whack her makes some sense. If she's trying to both use and kill May in the end, doesn't want her trauma, doesn't want her neutralized yet, always likes having someone else to do her dirty work. See Sith lesson one. Sith lesson number one is that you have to kill the Jedi without weapons, which actually means getting someone else to do it, maybe via subterfuge. Uh, for instance, getting an acolyte to do it for you or a gazillion clone troopers. Well, you pull the strings from the shadows. I'm not aware that's a canon Sith lesson, but it should be. Or maybe it's from one of the witch cults. I'm not married to the idea, but I don't think it's completely implausible or meritless. And good po peace and good pods, Ehoop. Ehoop, do you believe in aliens in the real world? Because I, <laughs> I feel like we've uncovered a conspiracy theory level to you that is... Uh, it's it's I, new and I like it. I'm like no, it. I think I think it's not completely implausible. And um we do have to say that they called out the fact that Pip's eyes were turned red, which is interesting. So I have two questions coming out of this. Like if so if someone gave Chimere the the thing you have to kill a, a Jedi without a weapon, and then Chimere passes it on to a new acolyte, you have to kill a Jedi without a weapon. Is this like a kill a Jedi without a weapon pyramid scheme going on or could be anything. <laughs> Nobody knows. I still think <laughs> kill a Jedi without a weapon is to like corrupt them or you know. Yeah, I think so too. It's it's to get them to attack you unarmed. Because yeah. we've heard that so many times and even Soul says it in this episode. Yeah. Um, but I have a question about Pip based on all of this, which is where and when and from whom did she get Pip? Hmm. That's a good question too. I feel like this is, I well, so Soul notices this now, which means she couldn't have had it when she was a Jedi, right? I guess. I mean, he has, to be fair, he's been spending a lot of time with her recently. Yeah, but that was her master. So he would have known yeah, if she had that droid but, earlier. Right, but he didn't say that she didn't, did he? No, but but I just feel I, like that's just a conversation that always. they would have had already. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he gave it to her. Good, good, uh, good point there. But I, but then I feel like he would call it Pip and not your droid. Well, I think that was also because he knew he was talking to May in that at that moment. Oh, true, true. Maybe he was trying to see if she'll say Pip. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think he. I my my interpretation is that he knew the whole time that it was May, but he thought like I, I'll try, you know, to get through yeah. with it to her while she's pretending to be Osha, and then. At the moment, she was like, actually, I'm going to call the cops on you. He's like, OK, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right, Tom, after episode five, said, hi, John and Alicia. I had a theory about Darth Thirsteef <laughs> claiming to be a Sith. I definitely think the theory that he himself is merely an apprentice is likely. But there was an angle slash prediction I had that wasn't mentioned in the show. I'm wondering if the Sith claimants we see aren't actually Sith. Uh, if they are that, uh, they will attend to the attention of the actual Sith hiding in the galaxy. I can't imagine they'd be happy that there's a group out there doing things in their name and riling up Jedi to be on the lookout and below their cover. I could see th if the current story is in a good place by season's end, that this season ends or next season begins with a confrontation of Chimere slash his master or even Chimere uh, slash his master receiving the Kelnaka treatment where to parallel May finding Kelnaka dead, Osha finds Chimere or his master dead with Darth no. Tenebris or Plagueis stepping out of the mm. shadows as the assailant would be a cool cliffhanger to end on and would allow future diving into what the real Sith have been up to this whole time. Thanks for all the coverage. I've enjoyed catching up on the timeline and hearing your thoughts, Tom PS. I'm actually enjoying the spoiler policy. I'm somewhere in the middle of Alicia and John when it comes to Star Wars knowledge, so I take it as a cool way to quiz myself to see if I know what you're talking about. 
Thank you, Tom. And we do have a special section at the end of the feedback uh, where we get into more feedback about what people think about the spoiler policy. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Very nice. Yes. Thank you, Tom. I, I like this idea that they're going to beat the Sith out. This is actually something that I think during the next era, there is a, uh, a whole thing of, of what do we do if one of the former Sith becomes too loud? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a whole thing where a Sith Lord has to deal with that. Like, a, you know, there's PR. There's PR for the Sith. Yeah, um, I think I don't think that Chimera's going to die this season, though. I think uh, that they're going to I mean, I think they know that that's <laughs> that's a draw to bring people back for season two. <laughs> <laughs> but he's such a good. So I know people like don't want him to be Plagueis. And I don't for the same reasons, which are vaguely like Plagueis is supposed to be a moon. And, you know, right. is he the right age and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, if he were Plagueis, which it's canon, like we don't really know much about Plagueis in canon, so it could be. Um, if he were somehow that, that would be cool just because he's such a good villain and that's such an important name in Star Wars history that it would just be nice to have like a really cool Plagueis. But I think it's more likely he's Venomous, who is um, who was Tenebris's second acolyte who he kind of portrait <laughs> instead of yeah. yeah yeah he was like no uh, you're not the one that i'm investing in i'm just gonna do experiments on you instead <laughs> fair enough and again this is something that we see recurring right is that they mm -hmm. they give lip service to the rule of two but in the end it's right. not really that it's not it's never really followed mm -hmm. yeah they are, there's always extras right all right let's move on to Arthur, after episode five, said regarding the episode on Acolyte where you made reference to red shirts, here's a crossover opportunity. I recently saw a cartoon entitled something along the lines of Schrodinger's crossover, where a bunch of red shirts were locked in a room with a bunch of Empire stormtroopers. Given the, tr the troops, uh, sorry, given the tropes. See, there's too many uh, TRO. On, <laughs> this is, again, we're like on our four podcast. Here. <laughs> um, given the tropes that red shirts are cannon fodder and that stormtroopers are incapable of hitting anything, what do you what find do you when find? you unlock the room? <laughs> Did the bullets bounce off the walls? Because that might help <laughs> the stormtroopers. <laughs> right, right. I feel like both sides accidentally kill each other. Kill each other, their selves, rather. Right. Yeah, that seems fair. <laughs> yeah. A gadling... A gadding... Ga <laughs> I can't talk anymore. <laughs> a gadding giraffe, after episode five, says... Regarding the use of two lightsabers as discussed in the podcast, I remember in KOTOR 2, they talk about different styles the main character uses. So single, two blades, and double lightsaber. An NPC mentions that the twin and double blades were more slaughter per swing, and lightsabers were meant to be more defensive weapons than offensive. I've always taken this to mean that a Jedi defaulting to more than one saber would be seen as too aggressive, or not sticking to the ideals of being a Jedi. Yeah. And I'm I'm gonna push back on that. I don't I don't think so. I think we see plenty of dual lightsabers for light side users. Um, I mean, we see we see some, but it is like so we that's when you have the dual light side uh, lightsabers, it's called Jarkai again, as we mentioned last week. Um, we do see some, but I think it is a more known to be a more aggressive style. So like mm -hmm. one character we see do it is Ahsoka and we won't spoil her plot, but yeah, she's, uh, we see it often with characters who are not like your traditional Jedi, at least let's say. Yeah. Also, I, I think that the whole point is that you only have two lightsabers if two kyber crystals call out to you. Right, exactly. So that's that's probably the biggest thing limiting it for sure. Yeah. Right. So like the will of the force is with the people who have two lightsabers. Right. I guess that's ooh. So what does that say about Chimere? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. Uh, well, at the same time, Sith often get their lightsabers by taking right. them and corrupting them. Right? right. So it's not the same as the way a Jedi, you know, naturally finds their kyber crystal. But that's but not all Jedi do because especially later in the timeline when you know uh, Jedi aren't doing things the same way for reasons. Um, we mm -hmm. see people just like finding lightsabers or inheriting them, or like yeah. at this point in the timeline, the dark sabers already being passed down from you know uh, Vizsla yeah. to Vizsla on Mandalore. Right. Good. Good. Uh, good points there. Mandalore. Yeah. 
Uh, and we do know, by the way, that Leslie Headland said several times that um, Kreia, who's a character in the second Code Org- uh, Knights of the Old Republic game, so I, I talked through her whole story in that episode in the Canon Timeline podcast feed. Um, but we know that Leslie, she's a particular inspiration in this show for Leslie Headland. Leslie Headland said, like, I, yeah, I looked at Kreia or Darth Treya, as she's called in Sith terms, and she's like, I'm, I'm taking some stuff from her. And one of the things she took from her is a lightsaber, lightsaber style known as Trakata. So Trakata is basically where you have a style where you take advantage of the fact that a lightsaber is one of the only melee weapons where you can retract the blade and uh, put it back out again. So they use this um, resheathing and unsheathing motion to like kind of do a tricksy way. So we saw this happen with Jackie where, you know, it's a second secret blade and then it just went pump, 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 punctured her real quick three times in a row. This would be called the flash slash move. Um, another move that they do in this Trakata is this uh, pass the blade where basically someone tries to block you with your blade. And so you, um, mm. you pull your blade in so you can sneak behind it and then stick it out again. And there's also nice. the unbalancing block where you're blocking someone else. And then, uh, so they have their lightsaber against yours and they're leaning into it. So you quickly retract your blade and they fall forward because they're off balance now. But the thing is not many people do this because both the Jedi and Sith look down on this, or at least they did in Legends because they thought it was kind of like a cowardly, cheap move, cheating kind of. Right. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, where was I? Because I scrolled down. Oh, sorry. Reader Reborn. Reader Reborn. So Chimere is either Vanestra's Padawan, not Imri. Who was her Padawan in the books, yeah. Okay. Or he's possibly any humanoid Sith Lord who ever existed. Or or something else. I'm gonna just gonna put that out there, right? Like it Mm -hmm. it could just be something else. And I like that if it is. Uh unless he's extended his life or used cryogenics, but Imri is blonde, so I don't think it's him. I do think Chimere extended his life or use cryogenics, though. And if it's cryogenics, he could be anybody. Yeah. And I asked if it could be mind transference. And he said, ooh, hadn't thought of that. Puts Imri card back on the table. Also both of Osha's mothers. <laughs> Quote, my mother could do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It could get inside the head. I, I would like that. I would like that mm-hmm. if it's... Uh, it should like, what if, back, yeah. Oh, man. What if... But, what it, if- but it can't be... No, but it can't be one of the mothers in Chimere, though, because... Then it's really creepy when he looks at her and says desire and pops the. Oh yeah, I don't like that. You're right. You're right. And Star Wars isn't going to do that. Disney is not greenlighting that. Right. This is not. This is not (laughs) Westeros. (laughs) Right. Right. Uh, Even in Westeros, I don't think that's going to. Yeah. Not. Not parents and children. Maybe like uncles and cousins and brothers. Yeah. Right. Abby, after episode six, says Vernestra is definitely Chimera's former master. I think she knows who did the destruction on Kofar. Will we see her? Uh, will we see next her attempts to spin another story to look good to the Senate? Her Padawan Mog sounded sycophantic. <laughs> Already suggested that Soul might be responsible. At least, mm. uh, and Abby had a little smirk face there. <laughs> uh, at least they collected the bodies, the bodies for burial on the dark, the Darth Thirst. Slash scar slash desire side. Oh my, Manny. Star Wars <laughs> is really horny, isn't it? And yeah. then she pointed out that the creatures are called Skura. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is the horniest Star Wars has ever been, and I don't hate it. It's as horny <laughs> as Maul. Yeah. We did get a proper sex scene of sorts in Andor. That's true. That's true. I like Star Wars growing up. Jean says. I mean, the show is hitting all cylinders for me, and this mystery has got me hooked. Cliffhangers were staples pre-streaming and all, uh, but I had all but forgotten how upsetting and exciting those erupt endings had me. LOL, 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 LOL. Chimere is such a very dope character, though. He keeps saying things that have me convinced that he's not Sith, but he very much has Sith tendencies. LOL, 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 LOL. What's going on? I love John John's use of uh, LOL because it lets me go la 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 la. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say la 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 la. Tra la 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 la. Thanks, John. I, I I agree. The cliffhangers I have mixed feelings about. Uh, I I kind of love them. It's fun. I mean, as long as like 
I think they're going to wrap it. She said they're going to wrap it up this season and, you know, leave some teases for a planned season yeah. two. But uh, as long as it's nothing obnoxious in the at the end of the season, I love a weekly cliffhanger where I can be like, ooh, but what's going to happen next? <laughs> Although I am a little annoyed. I'm like, Saul, freaking tell your story already. I know. <laughs> Hey, look, hey, I'll be happy as long as I'm not left with the identity of the stranger being, I am good. <laughs> Remember Rings of Power? Yes. <laughs> it was a whole thing, and I didn't like that. I didn't like that yeah. with the other stranger. It's, uh, I mean, so by the way, I have to say that the other stranger in, in Rings of Power, sorry, I'm going to say a spoiler for the first season of Rings of Power now, which came <laughs> out over a year ago. Um but I was really resistant at first for that it would be Gandalf. Um, I really wanted it to be a blue wizard or something. But by the end, it was like, well, yeah, of course, it's Gandalf. It makes sense. I'm on board. Um, and I think it's the same with Chimera. I was like, oh, I don't want it to be Chimera. Let it be someone less obvious. But then the reveal of Chimera happened. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. This is perfect. Right. Right. I hear you. I'm with it. All right, Rocky Zim says, interesting episode. Part of me wondered if he is an whole old Sith Lord like Exar Kun. Maybe he was possessed by Kun and was lured away from Roe. Wishful thinking on my part, LOL. Lol. Yeah. So Roe is Vanestra's last name. Um, and Exar Kun, we talked about him in the Old Republic overview, I believe. But, or maybe he's, anyway. He was a, uh, yeah, he was a former Jedi who turned to the dark side, became a Sith Lord. Um, he lived like thousands of years before this, but he, yeah, it's not impossible that he was in stasis or that he um, entered the mind of somebody else. Right. Uh, we did mention in the Old Republic overview that Exar Kun is probably most famous for inventing the double bladed saber. Right. Okay. Very cool. Davy Mack says, so we end up with Soul saying he's going to tell all and Osha putting on the helmet. I'm wondering if the sensory deprivation that Chimer talked about might help Osha clear her mind of any fiddling the Jedi may have done with her memory. So then, next episode, we simultaneously get Soul's story and Osha's true memory of what happened. I don't know if the Jedi messed with her memory or just withheld information. Yeah, I think probably with... Because we saw her side of things and she just had a limited view of what happened. Right. I, and I think it's more interesting that way, right? Just like mm -hmm. a comedy of errors kind of thing. Yeah. She was mostly in her room and missed everything. She just heard like a scream and, you know, and whatever right. the drama with her sister was. Right. All right. Thomas C says, I just found you and I'm head over here. Wait, did you Thanks. say Doove 71? Oh, I missed Doove. I can't yeah. miss Stu. Doove 71 says, I am having, having some time to think. My latest theory is uh, Chimere. Is Venestra's fallen Padawan picked up by Darth Tenebris, discarded early on? Chimir mm -hmm. wanders the unknown regions and finds Ren. Mm -hmm. Ren gives Chimir his philosophy and more training. Chimir wants some payback on both the Sith and the Jedi, so he plays a very long game. Okay, I'm into that. I'm into this uh, this Knights of Ren uh, yeah, th relationship. This is this is kind of where I am, where I'm like, well, I think, yeah, maybe he was a Jedi and he was a Sith and he was like rejected from both and then found this new philosophy, which might be connected to the Nile. I'm still putting that theory in the table. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Thomas C says, I just found you and I'm head over heels. Thanks for the passion and thank you for not falling into the let's hate Star Wars category. Would love to uh, hang out and bring all my action figures. Well, Thomas, tell you what. You you help spread the word about the lore hounds, and you get us to all like a million downloads a month, and <laughs> uh, we will we will throw a lore con, and there will be an action figure, there will be an action figure uh, station. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is the second time we promised a, a million downloads uh, an episode, and uh, we got lore yep, con. Yep. Yep. All right. It's out Marilyn, there. Marilyn, after episode five, said, "I would not say that the dark is needed for the existence of light." nor for balance. Balance is needed because the dark exists. In the Star Wars universe, I've yet to see the dark being used for love or for good, but it could po it could be possible. To my mind, the dark manifests when people um, make harmful choices. Wait, can I just say real yeah, quick, yeah. I, wonder, I said on the Discord to this that I wondered if um, the creation of Osha and May could be the dark being used for mm -hmm. good. And didn't Kymir heal her too? 
yeah, it's it's unclear because I thought it looked like he did a little bit, but she did still have it wasn't she wasn't completely healed this episode, but I yeah. don't know. Unclear. But but we we have seen in the books I've noticed that there are times where a Jedi says, Hey, I can do a little bit of healing. I'm not great. Mm-hmm. I will yeah. make sure that you're stable and then we'll get you to right. a real medic. Yeah, exactly. So that that could be a thing. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, the dark manifests when people make harmful choices. Anger, fear, violence all exist, and one must learn how much of those things they carry within themselves and decide how they are going to recognize and accept them without letting them be in control. Not to mention doing the work of whatever healing they can of those wounds. Of course, darkness in and of itself serves a very important function in nature. Bulbs, seeds, and roots could not function without darkness between beneath the soil. We are conceived and carried within the darkness of wombs. Digestion happens in darkness, and it is only when the sun's light is blocked that we can see the other stars in the sky. But these things are not about moral judgments or behaviors. We have chosen the binary light and dark to represent a moral framework, but that is distinct from a natural framework. Of course, your mileage may vary. Um. So... I have to say just about that in general is that I do think the the idea maybe in the beginning was like the more uh, black and white sort of fantasy storytelling that used to be more popular. And now in general, the world is like fantasy fans are more interested in gray storytelling and Star Wars has also drifted in that direction. We see in this show, especially, we see that... Um, like Chimir confronts Saul and he's like, well, it's not that you don't have darkness. It's that you're trying so hard to deny it, that it's getting in your own way. So right. in a bit. Right. And um, it actually reminds me of a conversation Luke and I had about the end of the Beacon 23 show. And I won't spoil the ending, but one aspect of it is that there is a, yeah, there's an entity that wants to create another entity to be as non-threatening as possible, you know, just, mm. um, and there's something like, and they come across as benevolent, but there's also just something highly sinister in that, in that when we completely deny our, the sad sides of ourselves, well, first of all, the, the lighter sides don't shine as brightly without that contrast of shadow. Um, right. but it's just unhealthy also, and it, it just always backfires. So I think. That it is uh, about the balance in terms of like the, the the Jedi are not right to say the anger doesn't exist, and not that they say it, but they're, you're not right to completely deny yourself of it because there are is use to these emotions, right? As outlets and other reasons. Yeah, and and there is also the <laughs> the problem, honestly, that uh, George Lucas has specifically said, "Oh, well, actually." the light side is balance in star Wars. Like the dark side is not part of the balance. And I yeah, don't I, think I this agree goes with against him about everything else. So I don't I know. Think, yeah. I, I, you're the only one who's told me about that and I believe you, but I, I choose to ignore that because it makes no sense with anything else. <laughs> this is like, th- this is on the level of, uh, Tolkien saying that the Lord of the Rings isn't an allegory for anything, you know, right. like it's mm-hmm. just, it's just, I think sometimes you're just, too close to your work and you can't see what it is from a distance. Right. Well, it's also, you know, you go through phases where you doubt things. Like I think of with interview with the vampire and rice at one point, she became uber Christian. She's like, Oh no, there's, there's not gays in my books. And then, <laughs> but her own <laughs> oh, son no. is, her own son is gay too. And then later on she like course corrected and she's like, Oh wait, no, sorry. Like here, here's some extra gays to make up for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Interview with the vampire aside, Marilyn continues. I think Soul didn't tell Osha what happened on the planet sooner because she wanted to be a Jedi, but was experiencing blockage from the trauma of what she had experienced on Brendok, and this interfered with her training. Whatever Soul knows is highly unlikely to have produced greater balance within Osha, I think, or else he would have told her early on. Then she left before he could tell her what happened, and he decided to leave it at that. It's also possible that the political side of the Jedi organization decided the less said about Brendok, the better. I will neither condemn nor defend that choice. So much depends on the wider political climate at the time. What the Jedi were going through and what they had recently been through. And many thanks to Alicia for asking her friend to ask a friend to give her reactions to possible Yoruba influences over the witchcraft we were seeing on Brendok. I had recognized the similarities between the name Osha and the Yoruba goddess Oshun. 
But I had no idea if the showrunners are deliberately using that echoing or if it's just, to their minds, a logical nickname derived from her full name, which escapes me at the moment. Yeah, no, I think um, that it's quite possible. There are like these these little um, Easter eggs like that in terms of naming. It's quite possible they might have intentionally because, you know, because Ocean is the uh, O-S-H-U-N, in spelled in English at least is the fertility goddess. And, you know, the thing about May and Osha are that they are like some sort of unnatural birth. Right. So they, it seems like, yeah, there's a good chance there was a link there on purpose. Yeah, that's interesting. Marilyn says after episode six, dang, they are being so mean to us. As soon as Soul said, I'm going to tell you and the music started, I thought, no, but I was right. It feels like TV of the 1950s and 60s to be continued. Yeah, that's my biggest complaint. And I, I know you like it, Alicia. Don't worry. We don't mm -hmm, have to re-argue it. <laughs> <laughs> I think Vanestra was Chimera's master. Something to tip the scales, she said, of the massacre, i.e. to shift the political opinion against the Jedi, which was already beginning to happen as shown in that brief scene with the senator. And I really did not need that view of dear dead Jackie. Jackie. Hmm. Though I'm glad someone took care of the bodies. Hmm. Could an island with cortosis, which really sounds like a medical condition rather than an ore or metal You're truly not be known <laughs> if it's it truly be unknown if it's so dangerous to jedi i know it's a big galaxy and this is i believe the outer rim osha as pandora and the helmet as temptation don't go for the unknown that's dangled by a dark warrior but didn't her breathing just sound like a certain darth blank <laughs> mm, yeah. <sighs> yeah 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 um, yeah, about Cortos. Yeah, this is in the Outer Rim, but I think it's rare enough that, and this is like early enough in the timeline where they haven't fully explored the Outer Rim. And a lot of the Outer Rim was behind this so-called storm wall for a while because of the conflict with the Nile, um, a hundred years before this. So it's, po yeah, I can see it's possible they just don't know where this is. I'm, um, uh, actually, Marilyn, I she kindly wrote in to talk uh, uh, in an episode that will have released just before this. I'll talk about this at the end of the podcast um, on the Canon Timeline podcast timeline. And there's I read a passage in it that's from a myth set at the beginning of the Star Wars timeline um, that just kind of reminds you how in the middle of nowhere space was to them and what an unknown thing it was. It was like crossing, going, exploring the outer rim, um, especially before yeah. this, but it was like, it was like going into the ocean and just hoping you find land, you know? Right. And the outer rim is one thing. There's also other threats to the Jedi, like the nameless that were not known before the high Republic right. era. So there's plenty, plenty going on that the Jedi are not aware of. Right. All right. Let's move on to Maureen D. You said, I'm wondering when the premise of the Jedi having a legal right to take children came into lore. I've always seen this as something the family had the option to approve. I haven't read any of the books. I've always seen the search for reincarnations of the Buddha as inspiration for testing children with the force. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that I mean, they they ripped that in Avatar The Last Airbender, but <laughs> it, it's in here, too. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, George Lu Lucas said, you know, that there were definitely Buddhist influences on the Jedi ideology. Right. And uh, Marilyn says, again, I'm wondering if this sort of stance is a reflection of some previous ch very challenging conflict with the Nile, maybe. Mm -hmm. I've heard Alicia talking about that in the context of the Jedi themselves, but I would be interested to know the wider implications for the Republic. I also would like to know more about how much what how much authority the republic has at this point and just how extensive that particular confederation was was the outer rim considered wild at this point yeah so they had actually made it further into the outer rim until the nihil forced them to retreat so it, it is yeah it is kind of pretty wild out there in the outer rim and indeed because of this conflict um it did lead to them pressing children to become padawans and padawans to become jedi at a younger age in order to confront that um and i think the effect that it had on the republic is that the republic did not have a standing army at this point um during the high republic mm. they just kind of like 
would try to do the thing, oh, when a conflict comes up, everyone has to send soldiers from every every planet in the Republic. Right. Um, which is a great idea, but uh, doesn't necessarily always work the way you want it to. I mean, and, that's, that's a traditional, like, yeah. medieval, feudal mm-hmm. style military, right? right? Exactly. Um, but I think basically what we're seeing is why the Republic and the Jedi start working more closely together and start becoming looking more like the same entity. Yeah, which I think uh, is an intentional sloppy. It's an intentional obfuscation of what the Jedi are by the Sith. Right. All right. So let's talk about the feedback from last week, top of last yeah. week, about the structure. So- of yeah. the podcast. I, I, it seems like you have a lot of notes here, so I'm going to pass it back to you. All right. Well, just I'll read this first one and then uh, you can read the other three. But um, so the first one, the other three were, I think, all email feedback or uh, Discord feedback. Um, the first one was a three star review left on the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast feed on Apple. And uh, the review says, spoiler, there's no spoilers. I love the Lorehounds for their in depth knowledge and insights into stories. But the Star Wars Acolyte pod is so spoiler restricted that it loses what makes the lore hounds great, the lore. So, yeah, um, I mean, of course, yeah, you, you're free to give me whatever kind of review you want. And of course, it's not your problem if it hurts my search rankings and makes it harder for the fledging podcast to find new, new listeners. But I do have to push back a little bit on the idea that the podcast lacks lore because I thought maybe it was the opposite. That was the problem that maybe there was too much lore. So. I think there's an abundance of lore. The, it's, I think it's the fact that we're not talking about specifically the movies you've seen directly that's throwing you, and I yeah. get that. Um, I, I wonder if it helps to think about it similarly to how in the House of the Dragon podcast, John, you've read Fire and Blood, but yeah. for David and for the listeners who have not, you don't say future spoilers in, right. uh, in that pod. Right. So. It's kind of a similar deal here. Like it's not, um, you can, you might say in, you know, oh, in Fire and Blood, oh, uh, people know this Alice Rivers is going to be interesting. Um, but you're not going to say like, well, this is what her story plays out. So I don't know. It, right. it, I, I wonder if thinking about it that way helps with the people who are feeling similarly to not Qbert. Yeah, I think people just aren't used to, um, they aren't used to, looking at Star Wars this way because it's always been told out of order. And mm-hmm. this is just a unique way to tell Star Wars. And I think it's a really interesting way and it hasn't been done before. And there's so many resources that are already like, here's all the references to later. And right. so we're trying to not be the wiki and we're trying mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, we're trying to do our own thing. Give you a different perspective. Yeah. 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 But your feedback, it's been noticed in the, uh, noted in the balance of feedback. So yeah, definitely as always, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And, uh, if anyone else has any more thoughts you want to share, then the inbox SW timeline podcast at gmail.com is open and uh, I definitely want to hear them. And if anyone does enjoy the way that we're covering the lore on this podcast and feels uh, willing and able to leave a review on the Star Wars Canon timeline podcast feed, wherever you're listening, it would be a huge help in getting this little podcast dream that I've been developing over the past couple of years off the ground. So. Yeah. Uh, reviews that encourage people to listen are very much appreciated. If that's not how you feel, obviously, then, you know. Right. But for anyone who does, thank you in advance. I love you. <laughs> All right. Chris M. writes in and says, Hello, Alicia. I have never written in or anything, but felt compelled after hearing the feedback you shared about spoilers from Lore Dumps. I have loved Star Wars for as long as I remember. As a youngling, I would read Star Wars encyclopedias and would love to know all the little things, trivia questions, and the like. I would watch the original trilogy movies over and over. I loved it. Although, as time moved forward, I continued to watch theatrical releases and love Star Wars, but I didn't make time for the lore. I played trading card games, and recently a fantastic game called Star Wars Unlimited was released. And it's very fun and very good. That's interesting. I've been eyeing that one. I just, I just don't want to spend money on another game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I was just talking to someone else who was playing it. Anyhow, this game got me to become intrigued with the lore again and catch up on all that I've missed. So I started watching Rebels, and it's fantastic. But there mm-hmm. is still so much more. What's next? How do I catch up? Well, your coverage has helped immensely with that. 
your Timeline podcast, and your lore dumps on the Acolyte coverage provide a very thorough and concise way for me to consume more and catch up with the Star Wars universe. But most importantly, I really feel it really fills out my understanding of the Acolyte episodes themselves. Knowing the lore behind factions, races, time periods, and whatever really, really helps it all come together. So please don't stop for all the podcasts I listen to that are a supplement to a TV series are for that purpose, to fill in gaps that I may have missed and to simply better understand the content. A bit of a ramble, but I simply wanted to express that the lore dumps help me enjoy and understand the show more and are important to me as a fan of Star Wars in general. I am with the lore hounds for lore. It's quite simple. And you are doing a fantastic job with all of your coverage since it began. Keep it up. Hoping I can record my Wookiee call at some point for you. (laughs) (laughs) Did you ever see, I I might have brought this up on a previous podcast, but did you ever see that whole thing where like this guy was mad at his ex-wife after a contentious divorce? You told me that, yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think that's so yeah. funny. It's like, but for, for anyone who didn't hear the story, what he got a bunch of people to call her and Wookiee sound. No, he her. put up posters that said, please call my phone and do your best Wookiee impression. I really want to hear it, which <laughs> look, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but also it's hilarious in hindsight. It is funny. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. Um, well, so yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, well, I thought, John, that you'd be excited about that. I, I'm pretty sure you're probably the one who talked Chris into re- watching Rebels. Oh, Rebels. I'm I'm a Rebel stan. I actually think I, I think that the consistent good episodes of Rebels are stronger than the Clone Wars. I think the Clone Wars highs are really high, but its lows are real low. Mm, and yeah. uh, and Rebels doesn't have that low. I think it's a really, really solid show from start to finish. Yeah, it's true. Everyone should watch it if they haven't yet. Yep. Bango31 says, listening to episode five podcast and the chat about including some more High Republic content, please do. I've only read the adult novels, which I'm not particularly impressed by, and I still feel like I don't know what the fuck is happening in the timeline. (laughs) Yeah, the adult novel, you really got to read the the YA novels at least because it's it's really incomplete. I don't know why they have them on like a separate track. They really should just all be included in the main track. Yeah, I mean, in the June, I think a lot of people don't want to read the junior novels because, and I was the same way, like because, um, because they called junior novels. So I'm like, well, I'm too old for that. But then, actually, some of the junior reading has been like the myths that I talk about in my canon uh, myths of of ancient Batu episode that just came out right before this. Um, those mm. are technically junior myth, like you know, junior aged myths, but they're just lovely little stories actually it's not it doesn't feel like a a kid thing there are child books that's different but nice bango 31 says wait no i just read that one it's been a long day guys already (laughs) last one uh reader reborn says uh i don't think it has to do with casual versus hardcore at all i think part of the appeal of the acolyte is that it's disconnected from the skywalker saga the you know uh, the you know who extremist haters aside, that's probably the biggest reason some good faith fans aren't with it. Swinging it back around to the podcast, that disconnect from the future of the timeline, I think is refreshing in the same way I think the acolyte is refreshing. Every other podcast, even the good ones, spent a bunch of time talking about Anakin and the prophecy after episode three, for instance. Hmm. Instead, you kept the focus tight. In short, what you are doing is amazing and unique, and please don't change. There you go. Listen, this is this is you and I talked after we got that first email. Right. And for me, I'm like, you have to just be unapologetic with the podcast you want to make, mm-hmm. because if you start changing based on every review, it's just going to be a right. Problem. Like if there's if there's legitimate critique and you want to like take some of that into account. Sure. But tweak it. Don't change it. You know. Right. Right. No, I mean, and that's why I think it's like I keep saying it's it's the balance. <laughs> The power of many, <laughs> but it is it is the balance of the different like opinions where we find the happy place. And if uh, so, we had one person who complained it's not enough lore, but I don't think that's really what they meant. Although that's that is what people who look for the feed are going to see first, right? Um, but uh, I think for the yeah most part, it seems like, and someone else who complained about lore being too much, and then it seems like other people are like, no, this is a happy medium. This is what I'm looking for, and since it's what. I was looking to do because what it's like, like I said, I think of myself as the first listener, because if I'm not making it 
for myself as a listener than, you know, who am I targeting? Um, so yeah, just trying to find the happy medium between that. And I appreciate everyone's patience and being willing to go along the journey and find their fun in it with, I, I liked hearing like someone likes to quiz themselves about, yeah. Oh, what are they fun. talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned already that on this, uh, on the Star Wars Canon timeline podcast feed, uh, just before this, a uh, day before this in the public feed, I released a new episode that, but I backdated it to May. So this is the beginning of my backdating experiment. So, um, I know how that's going to show up in some podcatchers, but not in others. So I'd love to hear if that like popped up with a notification for people, if you're a subscriber to that feed or how that worked, but you might have to scroll back to, uh, toward the beginning of the overall podcast list, because this is a, it, it's ancient myths. It's set at the very, very beginning of the timeline. Um, and yeah, in addition, in my canon ancient myths of planet Batu, there are updates on the Dawn of the Jedi film. Uh, and there's our first mailbag episode with Bob uh, showing back up to talk, uh, share some yeah, of his nice. spoiler free acolyte thoughts too. And also while I was doing research for this episode, I found more about like the nature of the force, which is something some people have been asking about. So hmm. I do a little, uh, uh, a little dive into how that's been talked about in various, especially books at the end yeah cool yeah and then on the rest of discord yeah you guys are uh deep in it with hot d so now you've you're doing what three hot d <laughs> episodes a week yeah it's kind of stupid but it's fun <laughs> it's good yeah. it's good it's good content we do we're doing our hot takes sunday night we're doing the main and the hot takes are patreon and supercast exclusive uh we're doing the main coverage for that which was like two and a half hours this week and then another hour and a half feedback episode just released yeah. Wow. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Do it a lot. A, yeah. All the way in on House of the Dragon, but I think most of the audience is too. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and of course, Second Breakfast. We just mm -hmm. uh, released that. Two and a half hours on that one too for hotel <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> Uh, and also a new form of raw dogging. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you think. I promise. <laughs> it's you and it's I had safe for yeah. work ish. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then we also just filmed, like we said right before this, our new 11 Zs where we it. do, I filmed it, recorded it, whatever. <laughs> we, we put I it hope on, no bad, but he had a on the electronic. I didn't brush my hair yet today. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we recorded it about uh, the fifth element. It's, it's our new monthly extra movie breakdown for subscribers. So that was fun. It was fun. I, I love that movie. You were okay. <laughs> David was meh. <laughs> yeah, we definitely had the Goldilocks treatment on that podcast, but that's okay. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, and we've got um, Rings and Rituals is uh, wrapping up. They're getting toward the end of the season one. Oh, they recap. finished season one. Oh, they, they finished, finished season, season one. one. Oh, I uh, haven't listened I, to the last episode yet. I'm going to be on next week. I have to edit it still, but I'm going to okay. be on with Marilyn next week talking about the music of season one. Ooh, and then cool. I know they're going to have a feedback episode. So you still have a little time to get in the feedback. Go write it into Rings and Rituals at thelorehounds.com. Okay. Uh, and then Radioactive Ramblings is also doing The Boys. Right. They are doing season four, episode five this week. Other than that, I think that's it for our affiliates right now. Everybody else is on a break, including you on Will Shift Dust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's still definitely, if you haven't yet, check out that interview with Glenn Mazzaro because that was just really interesting, even if you didn't watch Beacon 23. But um, we're going to be back soon there with Dune coverage. Nice. As soon as I'm a little less overwhelmed with the acolyte. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, all right. So do you want to thank our Discord server boosters? Do you have the music for me? Oh, I, I do not, actually. I should have uploaded <laughs> right. the music. That's all right. I'll go, all right. Do, 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 there you go. Discord server do, boosters, do, 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 Gnarls, Aaron K, Tiller the Thriller, do, Dork of the Ninjas, do, do, Dove 71 do, Captain Jinji 56 do, Athena A. And Lore Masters, Samarchin, Michael G, Michelle E, David W, Brian P, SC, Peter OH, Bettina W, Adam S, Nancy M, Dove 71, Brian 8063, Frederick H, Sarah L, Gareth C, Eric F, Matthew M, Sarah M, DJ Miwa, Andra B, Kwang Yu, Dead Eye Jedi Bob, Nathan T, Alex V, Aaron T, Sub Zero, Aaron K, Dally V, Mothership 61, Gnarls, Kathy W, Stuart B, and Adrian. Ta -da. 
We're having a great time here. (laughs) Great job, Alicia. That was fantastic music. I just slightly arrhythmic, but whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Who cares? It's fun. Well, thank you all for joining us for this breakdown of episode six. Can't wait to come back with episode seven. Are we putting our money on free will or choice for the title? Um, I hope it's free will. I feel like that's more interesting of a title. Right. Well, it's their choice or is it? I guess it's predetermined. (laughs) We'll find out (laughs) next week. (laughs) See you all then. (laughs) Bye. The Lorehounds podcast is produced and published by The Lorehounds. You can send questions and feedback and voicemails at thelorehounds.com slash contact. Get early and ad-free access to all Lorehounds podcasts at patreon.com slash thelorehounds. And connect with us on Twitter at The Lorehounds. Any opinions stated are ours personally and do not reflect the opinion of or belong to any employers or other entities. Thanks for listening. Okay, David, this is where we're supposed to choose a side, green or black. John, my soul is as black as night. Your turn. I am black for life. So we're not fighting? I thought this is where HBO wanted us to like pick sides and fight and stuff. Don't worry. I'm sure we'll find plenty to disagree about on the pod, but we seem to agree on one thing. We both really like this show. The politics, the drama, the lore. It was made for the lore hounds. And since we just finished recapping season one, we couldn't be more ready to defend our black queen in the Dance of the Dragons. And with the season pass option in Supercast, Listeners can get early ad-free access to each weekly scene-by-scene deep dive, plus our custom show guide with all the characters and connections. See you in the Lorehounds podcast feed each week for our Dragonfire hot, but probably positive, takes. The Lorehounds House of the Dragon coverage is also safe for Team Green consumption. Side effects may include a deeper understanding of dragon lore, a hardened conflict with itself, and an inescapable urge to read the book Fire and Blood by George R.R. Martin. Dragon seeds may experience burning. I'm so